Flash of Beauty, Bigfoot Revealed, reporting for duty. I am Jill Remensnyder and my lovely co-host. You might recognize him from today's interview. It's we're here. It's we're, Tobe Johnson. Yeah, we're up in, uh, in God's country, right on the border of Canada, clandestine stuff in Medellin Falls. And uh, we are kind of in a Last Supper rotating position here with several faces, some which you haven't seen, some which you have. Let me introduce the moderator, the director, clandestine Brett Eichenberger. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, guys. It's great to see you. Thanks for tuning in tonight. Right. And uh, off the cuff. Special guest. Drum hey roll, please. Just How's it going tonight? tonight? Thanks for joining us. We're having a lot of fun here talking before our event tomorrow about everything Squatch and more. <laughs> and the one and only Michael Ferry, cinematographer. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying our That 70s Show effect here, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here we go. Wheel okay. of Squatch. So, I'm gonna share the screen, Tom lean in, so. All right. Basically, we're all here for the big uh, Paranormal Bigfoot screening in, uh, in Medellin Falls, uh, being sponsored by Selkirk Sasquatch Events. And we're going to be doing a screening at the Historic Cutter Theater tomorrow. If you're in the Medellin Falls area, come on out and join us. It's going to be amazing. Um, this theater, if you're if you're from the Portland metro area, it has a very uh, historic uh, kind of McMinimans vibe to it. Um, the Postman was filmed here, so if you're a Costner fan, I'm telling you, the backdrop here and your Costner, it's a field of dreams. It's a situation, ladies. I know you love them. Come out here, get in God's country. And I've never been here before. We were toying with going to Sandpoint full time, living out that way by Lake Ponderay. There's a gorgeous river here. We've got reindeer, we've got Sasquatch, and uh, we're at an Airbnb set in the 70s. I got a picture of Jesus right on the wall looking at me. I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> there he is. Oh, there he is. Yeah. Not Simeon. You're pointing at Simeon. No, I was, but there we go. Right there. Right well, there. Simeon's kind of close to Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. He is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, if we're going to talk about quantum physics and how some of these abilities in Sasquatch work. <laughs> That's right. I mean, either Jesus or Simeon. Um, so Jill and I are used to doing this miles apart, right? I'm in Was Washington and she's down in Oregon. Uh, once in a while we get together and do these lives. Um, but this is an opportunity for us all to be in the same area. And more than just promoting a film and this great event, um, it's an opportunity for us to network for future projects. And uh, I think that's what's happening here. After hours, there's a bonfire, there will be wine, there will be conversations, and then we will talk about those later. But maybe, Jill, you and I could do a recap here before we talk about this again about what dropped, because we had two yes. videos. The last video was an unexpected drop, right? Talk about the last one that you did last week from Utah. Oh, yes. Okay, so, and Brett can chime in on that too. So, yeah, so I think if you've been following the channel and like in the community section, so Reader's Digest version of what's going on. Try not what, to rock the table, guys. People are watching. Let's oh, go. Okay. Be respectful. We have people from North Carolina. We've got people from Farmington, um, New Mexico, Flagstaff. Okay. All over the place. Oh, yeah. Flagstaff. Okay, yeah. so basically my my niece, our niece got married on St. Saint Patrick's Day in Flagstaff, Arizona. And on the way down, we were... We had heard of so many stories and sightings that take place in that area. We thought it'd be great to connect with people and and tell their stories. Uh, like I've tried to explain to some people, I overcommitted, so we had to really thin it down. Um, and I feel awful about that. So hopefully we will be able to come through again and sit down with you. Um, but one of the stops we made along the way was with Michael Shepard. And Michael had some pretty amazing 
uh, encounters and experiences at East SETI Ranch. Now, I know a lot of people in the comments, people were like, what? There's just like a ranch you can show up and have these experiences? Yes, there is. It's uh, Trout Lake, Washington, right. in the shadow of Mount Adams, where we've had UFO experiences and sightings. Mm -hmm. um, gosh, Ashley Stinnett, who's featured in uh, our sequel. Wave, she's watching. Oh, yeah. oh, hi, Ashley. Um, <laughs> hi, Ashley. She, hey, Ashley. Hey, Ashley. Don't look at the I'm not going to spin it around really fast and <laughs> so everyone can say hi. But, you know, she's told us about uh, encounters she's had at East SETI. And well, she worked there. Okay, well, I'm going to pass it off to Tobe to chime in about East SETI. Just let's right. set, set the... Simeon, have you been? Not yet, no. Never been. Okay, so the deal is, is right there under Mount Adams in Trout Lake, Washington, outside of Bingen. Where it's, yeah, uh, north, north. Right, north. it's less than 30 minutes away from the Klickitat ape cat phenomenon, which we barely even talked about that, but there is an ape cat out that way. Actually, at East Eddy Ranch, they worship a cat hybrid alien called Bacall. They have paintings of uh, feline hybrid humans all over their meditation area. Uh, you sit underneath what's called the field, I think it's called the field of dreams. No, that's Barb Shoup's area. Regardless, there's people from all over the world that go there to have experiences. Dave Schrader from Darkness Radio, who we've talked to, has had stuff happen there. Um, Clive, Jimmy Church. Jimmy Church, Clive Lewis, or another DJ. People come from there. I've been there. I've been there four times. There's some shenanigans that go on there, uh, hoaxing, in my opinion, stuff that is total BS including the lights that are seen on the mountain. Uh, I think those are hikers. If you talk to Mel Skahan, there's a route mm -hmm. that hikers do at night to get up to the top for the summit. On the right-hand side, yeah. Do they float above the mountain and then zip off into space, those hikers? Yes. Okay. Yeah, they do. Just, they, just checking. Yeah, they have goblin <laughs> jetpacks, and they shoot off to Alpha Centauri. Just checking. They go to Uranus. Okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So listen, stuff does happen. There's hoaxing in this, right? There's money to be made. I think that that goes on there, and so does Ashley. Um, she talked about that as well. However... There's Bigfoot stuff there, and there's what I would call apportations very similar to the Al Moon Lab. Uh, we had those experiences as well. But it goes hand in hand, and so to go there is to have an experience and also kind of have to weed out all the shenanigans that, that happen as well, because people get hyperbolic, they want stuff to happen. It's just life, right? And so if you haven't been, it's literally like 20 bucks, to put a tent in, you sit in the field, you can get one of their crazy hippie yurts, you can go hang out with James Gillen and do whatever with him. Um, I take that back. But listen, you can, go, <laughs> you can go there. I suggest you do go there, 20 bucks, right? But you can do what Brett and Jill do, and you can go have your own experience on Mount Adams. You don't need any money, just gas money, to get up that way. And so this is what the story was about. Am I talking too much? No, you're good. Okay. I know. Just say. <laughs> well, basically, and so we had we kind of pre-interviewed Michael ahead of time and had some conversations with him about his encounters, and we asked him because he had there was so much going on. We're like, let's keep it focused on Bigfoot, even though we want to hear more about where was he, where did he have his hey. Brett. Brett. Yeah. I'm like over Sorry, here. Sorry, I'm, I'm moderating. Yeah. Brett's moderating the chat, so yeah. he's, you know, okay. keeping the peace. Um, Michael's uh, UFO experiences. Area 51? He was in, oh yeah, he had... That's um, not in the interview, though. I... But we're getting oh, follow okay. along. Okay, sorry. I'm <laughs> so moderating. we didn't we didn't include all of his Area Fifty One uh, stories, and they also have some. They have ranch. They have a ranch kind of in the proximity of like where it, the Vernal area between Skinwalker Ranch and Blind Frog area, and. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this is what happens when Mike's around. He gets all camera happy. This is why we can't have nice things. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, it was, I think, um, some great encounters. And, you know, I, I also think that some people, and we've talked about this, some people time. are a magnet for this type of activity. Kind of like, once you see it... <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what is it, like this? Yeah, okay. Sorry, this is the unfiltered. We don't have editing power right now, but go ahead. 
<laughs> so what she meant to say was, you want me to fill it in? Or you got it? No, go ahead. I'm just making fun. So listen, the deal is that sometimes people are tuning fork for this stuff. Like, I don't have the nod. If I was out with Simeon, let's say he's got an attachment of some kind, he gets the action, so I have to piggyback off his latent <clears throat> ability. That's the tuning fork, right? One fork, one blade, nothing happened. You gotta have the two. So Daryl, you know, the Al Moon stuff, that was, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Okay. So anyway, so yeah, so we had Michael's interview came out, and then... I'm looking at the <laughs> Webster's Dictionary. Go ahead. And then today, <laughs> Tobe's interview finally dropped. Ooh. And Tobe Johnson, right here, his interview came out oh, okay. today. Okay. And I, you guys, if you enjoyed Tobe's interview, there's plenty more where that came from because we kind of held off on releasing that because Tobe, <laughs> because it's an embarrassment. Right, because it's an embarrassment. <laughs> no, no. <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> His lack of eye contact is confusing and the ramblings were really disturbing. Go ahead. <laughs> I know the private discussions. No. <laughs> right. No, but what I wanted to say was um, because we filmed so much, we the filming was staggered with you and Daryl. <laughs> right. Keep going. <laughs> hey, <Anyway>. this <laughs> the live stream has just been hijacked. <laughs> so basically, somebody I know that's very close to me edited Tobe's interview and put it out, and... Uh, Basically, what you're seeing in that interview is a huge component of a flashy beauty, Paranormal Bigfoot, which is now on the Members Only channel. So you can either rent it on Amazon or you can become a member. Even if you become a member for a month, you can watch it. You can watch all the other videos that are Members Only and the other videos that come out for members before they right. go public. So anyway, so... Yeah, okay. Tobes was available to the members a few days ago, actually. All right, so I want to so bounce some questions. I just questions. wanted to just say that, but... I have, yeah, so a lot I have of composure again. Okay. Okay. okay, and you guys, I apologize. And anyone who knows me understands that I cannot keep it together. If you look at me the wrong way, I will just start laughing. And right. so... <sighs> Bring it back. You got this. Stan I have my degree in theater arts. Stan so. yeah. Think of the pain. Pull from what I know. <laughs> right. um, no, but what I really want to say is that the fact that what you saw of Tobe's interview, there was so much more to it because originally our first interview with Tobe and Daryl was on a hot July day in 2020 on the back of a pickup truck. <laughs> okay. That's coming. We're going to release all that. It stuff. sounds so erotic when you say it like that. <laughs> Jesus. Daryl and I are on the back of the pickup truck explaining our. Our season Bigfoot action, and, and that's obviously going to come to you soon. Listen, obviously it's been a long day for us here. Just forgive us here. Um, it's like an eight-hour drive yeah. to get here. So the video footage that you see of me, right, is me back in Port Orchard doing my thing wood carving, And, uh, you know, that was born out of the pandemic, right? Like, because I had an office job. I was a truck driver. I shot x-rays. Why not try my hand at wood carving? But as a man obsessed with the issue, it wasn't bears, it wasn't salmon, it wasn't mushrooms, it was squatch faces. By the way, you can pick those up on Facebook at woodwatchers.com. But what I want to do is I want to turn the conversation over to mainly Simeon here regarding some of the issues here that we bring up at the Al Moon Lab. So Simeon, I'm going to ask you a series of questions here a back and forth here since you know people are watching this video they're responding to the information of what i would call contactees sasquatch contactees you come from a world of you know looking into remote viewing uh looking into the world of crop circles and now this and you're seeing the same overlap that is discussed in places like skinwalker ranch so east city ranch skinwalker ranch the al moon lab bradshaw ranch these are just power spots. They're all over the world. You can go to USGS and look up magnetic anomalies on the US map. And a lot of these are within the vein of power spots. I'm, one of my working theories here, Simeon, is, is one of the things that Dr. Travis Taylor brought up with Eric Bard, is that the common ground with power spots that they think, and one of the theories is, is that they're in a parabolic dish-shaped area, the Uinta Basin, for example. 
Same with the Al Moon Lab, right? Like the mountains are here. They're rich with quartz and gold. There's running water in this particular, it's the Willamette River, I believe. <clears throat> I don't think there's running water through Skinwalker Ranch, but probably underground. Yes. Uh, okay, It's good. the bottle, bottle, Bottleneck Reservoir. Bottleneck Reservoir okay. is, is close by, yes, and there's a lot of water underground. And there's electrical uh, lines yeah. running to the north of Skinwalker Ranch. Ryan Skinner's done all this research. Okay. Yeah. So let's pass this around here. Mike, you chime in. My theory is, is that this is the correct theory, that they're, they're saying that a meteorite caused this initial, like, scablands effect, right? That there was this impact theory that happened. There's a, all this charged material. Speak to that in a way that's more cohesive than that. Well, Tubbs, I, I just have one word to say to you. T-Dog. Plastics. That's <laughs> <laughs> the future, Benjamin. What, what is that? I missed the line. Is that the graduate? Movie? Graduate. Oh. Mrs. Robinson. Oh, yes. Mrs. Robinson. Yeah, I was raised on Three's Company, and now we're here with a bunch of film nerds. So go ahead. Okay, so I missed the graduate, but anyway. Well, you know, uh, the meteorite. I actually haven't heard it quite put that way, but it, it does make sense if you think of this other sort of theories we've been talking about, you know, in Paranormal Bigfoot 2 and so forth. Uh, Flash of Beauty 2, Paranormal Bigfoot. It's uh, any type of compression that you have in materials is going to make it more likely for anomalous types of electrical activity, charge clusters, things like that to exist. So, uh, it's possible that those portal areas, there's something different, you know, geomagnetically, and then mm -hmm. that leads to that type of compression. You have minerals, you have uh, silicon and other types of quartz, things like that. Uh, carbonaceous materials. It's what do you mean by that? Longer. Explain that to them, carbonaceous materials. Uh, you have gilsonite. You have a lot of gilsonite. Mm -hmm. Which is that yeah. black, fact, when black we were stone. in Vernal, I yes. was able to buy a piece of that yes. very, yes. very kind of glassy but light. Like foam. Right. And we've got a lot of excess electrons in carbonaceous materials that can lead to electronic activity. So you have a combination of a lot of gilsonite with the pressures a long time ago, perhaps of a meteorite meteoric impact is going to lead to um, charge clusters, exotic vacuum mm -hmm. objects, kind of a range of phenomena that you don't normally, you know, see in other places. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in my view, that leads to these sort of fluctuations in electromagnetic fields uh, through, you know, what we call permittivity the electrical constant in materials. If there's some fundamental variation in that electrical constant across a wide range of areas, mm -hmm. you're gonna get a lot of phenomena happening that you just don't ordinarily see. Uh, it, it's not just superconducting mm -hmm. types of phenomena. I mean, we, we see that in terms of batteries shorting out, mm -hmm. strange electrical activity, devices not working properly. It's sort of like an excess of, uh, electrical motion, electrical mm -hmm. movement. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, my view is that makes it easier for these shadow types of life forms mm -hmm. to self-organize and coalesce, which is why you get this type of cryptid activity mm -hmm. in these same areas where you get, we call them portal areas, but perhaps Travis and Eric are right, that it has something to do with the geological structure impacts of meteorites and so forth. I mean, there's other places like that. There's the Marley Woods so-called ranch in Missouri and uh, yeah, Marley Woods, uh, Alakine and uh associate Tel Ted Phillips uh, studied extensively, spoke at uh, oh. the Ozark UFO conference about Marley Woods. Okay. And okay. what he described listening to that seemed to me nearly identical mm -hmm. to what was happening at Skin Walker Ranch. Mm -hmm. You have Elbert County, Colorado, uh, East Eddy Ranch area. You know, these, mm -hmm. we call them portal areas, but, you know, in my mind, they're areas where it's easier, mm -hmm. uh, quite honestly, for parallel reality type phenomena to emerge and mm -hmm. so spontaneously self organize. Let me just give you one example. At Marley Woods, 
we've heard about cryptids, they had these strange, unidentifiable animals that looked like huge polar bears walking across that they were able to get photographs of. And they were seen walking through a barbed wire fence after the rancher shot at one of them. And it just kept walking and went through a fence. And when they went for the footprints, they were three-toed footprints. It wasn't just Ted Phillips and crew that saw this. A local radio show host on her way to work reported something that looked kind of polar bearish like. As far as we know, there's no wild polar bears in Missouri. <laughs> but this is the sort of thing that people see around these sort of so called portal areas. So it seems like you're getting other types of life forms that, I mean, they may be around us, we don't see them, but they seem to manifest in some of these places. You also get, of course, lots of orbs, time slips, uh, UFO activity. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what you guys were saying before about my you know, point of view on this is correct. You get a range of phenomena happening simultaneously. You don't just get one sort of, uh, of these phenomena showing up. They show up and, and any of these areas, you seem to get a lot of this activity. Also the Bradshaw Ranch mm -hmm. in Sedona. So yeah, in my view, there's something, just to sum it up, I know I'm saying a lot here. There's something about the geology of it, the structure of it, the minerals that allow this sort of excess conductivity in physics, what we call a permittivity shift. And once you have that going on, I'm just going to sum it up here. It leads to what people have called space-time metric anomalies, with some people in OSAP, the government UFO program, called space-time metric engineering. It's possible it's not just ETs or whoever the occupants of these craft are that can do this space-time metric engineering. I think that they're biological life forms that already inherently know how to do this, and they're taking advantage of these areas and showing up in these places. Okay, that, okay, so I have a question just to yeah. carry on there, is with, with people having all these cryptid sightings, especially in these, these concentrated areas, these power spots, so yeah. why is it that Bigfoot or Sasquatch is the most common one sighted? Is that, why aren't we seeing more, I mean, does, does that have to do with location, like when you... You talk about um, the like the Mothman or um, help me really out. I just question. but like I polar the the walk the polar right. bears going through fences. It, does it have to do with just the local the dynamics the history? No. That is an excellent question, Jill. I remember someone in our our Bigfoot Zoom group that we do twice a month. You know, once I started coming across these witnesses like you all have and you've put in your movies. I've come across them too, and I wanted to get a group together so we could flesh out what was going on. We had one guy from Little Rock area talk about a black dog that was seen coming through the wall. And he said the entire family saw it. His dad was a state trooper that worked in Clinton's body, you know, security team when he was governor of Arkansas. The dad saw it too. They were searching the house for this black dog that walked through the wall while they were eating dinner. And he was talking to a friend. I'm just mentioning this because it clicks in. He mentioned this to a friend and they had had the same thing happen in the same neighborhood. So to me, what it comes down to is there's a certain type of resonance of the earth that makes mm. it easier for some types of cryptids to coexist with us and to exist in this seemingly parallel reality. It's a question I ask myself every day. Where, where are they? Where are they right now? If we were to go out to these They're woods... Right here. Yeah, I mean, if we were going out to these <laughs> woods, I mean, are they out there deep in the, or are they sort of in some sort of other space-time configuration mm -hmm. within the same space we're in, but they resonate more with mm -hmm. trees or natural landscapes. So I would imagine some of these cryptids, for instance, the dogmen seem to be associated often with Midwest, Michigan. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Why, why don't you see more dogmen in New York? Mm -hmm. You get more, you know, Sasquatch hey, over I'm there. Dogman. Hey, because you know, <laughs> hey. I'm a dog man. I'm a Bronx hey, dog man. Okay, well, wait, so so I, I think there's a resonance <laughs> issue to it. It's like a spectrum of frequencies. Yeah. We're really hardwired by our culture to see one part of the spectrum, mm -hmm. right? But they exist across, and it's tuned based on geology and probably history and all sorts of factors in specific areas. Some areas you get black dogs walking through walls. 
in other places you get other types of groups. That's that's my sort of basic view of it. But it's a really good question, and it's something that you know we need to really consider. Okay. Well, on that note, do you think? Okay, just based on uh, geological <laughs> geological aspects, do you think also like trauma that has taken place on the land can dictate that resonance and that frequency and how things appear and manifest? Yeah, it really seems to because you know around. My dad used to take us to Civil War sites. He was a real buff of Civil War areas, and he would take us down south on vacations to Virginia and areas like that where uh, there had been lots of battles. And as a kid, I wasn't really sensitive to the issue of people seeing spirits, phantoms, and ghosts. But when you read the literature, even just around Bigfoot and branching off into other types of cryptids, you come across people seeing soldiers dressed in this confederate uniforms and you get this smell of gunpowder and smoke oh, and sulfur hello which you often get at any sort of paranormal site which tells us that there's an electro magnetic chemical component to all of this mm -hmm. in other words these are not just phantasms of our minds mm -hmm. in the simian view of this there's a specific frequency component that's related to the geology and the history. So to your question, yeah, I think the historical events, events would affect the preponderance of energies right. that took place maybe in some of those battlefields. There's never been as much, you know, biological energy put into that area before, mm -hmm. except when these horrendous battles that are part of our history here in the U.S. took place and thousands of people would die as well energy and emotions right mm -hmm. and it somehow lingers on in the space and people see it physically manifest mm -hmm. i've read so many stories of people seeing these confederate soldiers even popping up and saying hey did you lose something and it's like a mm -hmm. a bullet casing or something they test wow. it and it's a hundred years old yeah it's not something you could easily you know Come up. Well, hey, go, ahead, go ahead, Tobes. You have a question. Oh, no, no, I'm, no. I'm well, talking I mean, right here. The, these yeah. these are just my ideas about it. So yeah. these, you know, the apported gifts from yeah. these centuries yeah. are yeah. the things that we're talking about, and they're these <clears throat> gifts of significance, right? Things that, in our case, we had recently talked about, and one of those actually was a bullet casing, a right. turn of the century Peter's uh, rifle casing. My question to you is, and you know, I don't know how to put this in the category scientifically, so. You help me out with this, Sim. Can I call you Sim? I like that. Let's call him Sim. I'm going to call him Sim. Um, sure, call him Doc. Yeah, Dr. Sim. Um, <laughs> Doc! Doc! Ain't that? What's up, Doc? Um, What's up, Doc? No, so okay. one of the things that um, was precursor to the app horse was the clicking sound or the boom right. or the tapping sound. My theory was, is that, and it's not a very good theory, it's just kind of what I got going on, is that before these objects came into this existence, they had to break through this paranormal sound barrier and manifest, and that was the sound. Now, these are predicated by Bigfoot sightings as well, including that are the car door slam, yeah. which is a very common, or what people call the trap door, mm -hmm. or the boom mm -hmm. sound. Mm -hmm. There's a really interesting video from Brazil of a, a government tunnel being uh, drilled, and these construction workers are watching the tunnel swallow up on a metric, and there's great footage of this, right? But there's this boom sound, this very familiar boom, mm -hmm. whisping sound that's almost like the tunnel's breathing. So what is that as far as what you've looked into and how does that relate to the energy or, you know, what you call, and this is, you know, when we try to explain your book in a thumbnail sketch of what you talk about in Dark Matter Monsters Go By Now, is that we're dealing with a variable and not a constant, right? We're dealing with something that's a building blocks of the Big Bang that still exist in some form. So let's talk about these boom click sounds. Yeah. I've got Bigfooters watching this right now that are recording in habitat, right? Bigfoot areas, and they're hearing what sounds like a, th uh, a snapping or a switch right. sound. It sounds almost like a knob being turned. Right, and you know, one of the first people that I know about to record the clicking sounds or experience them was Ron Moorhead in the Sierra Camp. Remember, he talked about the strange car door slammings. There was the time where it sounded like all the pots and pans were being held 
place yeah. is being turned upside down. They go out in the morning expecting the whole camp to be just... You know, right. And nothing's been touched. And then the clicking sound, which moved between them in the hunting structure between their sleeping bags, right? Kind of like a cricket, but they would turn the light on. There was nothing there. What this has to be is a type of directed energy uh, frequency. And the reason we know it's a direct, this is not ordinary sound. This is what's called coherent sound. Oh, I like it, that. Yeah, coherent sound, in, and you can look it up. Uh, sound is something, that, this is something about sound. It's normally not directional. It spreads out in all different directions. But something interesting about these Sasquatch sounds, they don't spread out in all directions. How many times have you heard people say that it sounded, the, the roar, scream, growl, howl of the Sasquatch was the loudest thing they ever heard. It sounded louder than a freight train. They walk 100 feet to other people in a tent. And uh, did you hear that? And they say, we didn't hear anything. And they'll always, the first witness will always try to discount it. Maybe they were drunk, this and that. I don't think that's what it is at all. I think that these sounds are a very it's a different type of sound than we've encountered before. A directional type of sound, more akin to a laser, oh, which is like a beam, but with sound. The way you create coherent sound is the sound waves have to be in phase and you keep stacking the amplitudes so that all of the sounds are mm. completely in phase with each other and you get coherent sound. So this like infrasound, but with actual... Directionality. Yeah. And I think this is what the Bigfoot community has gotten completely wrong so far. Just saying it's like infrasound, kind yeah. of like whales. Incredible the way they can signal other whales a thousand miles away in the ocean. Giraffes, incredible the way they can communicate with other giraffes, but those are non-directional sounds. They, they go out in all directions. Mm -hmm. This is not what Sasquatch is doing from my point of view, and therefore it's not just simple infrasound. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a good analogy, but I don't think it's literally infrasound. It's a type of directed energy uh, frequency. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't quite call it a technology, but it's coming from biological tissue. How they're able to do this, you know, Scott Nelson's talked about the ability of Sasquatch to vocalize on both inhales and exhales simultaneously. Right. So what Sasquatch has the ability to do is a incredible control over the sounds that they emit. And it seems to me that they're creating coherent sound somehow by doing this. Think of Tibetan monks chanting. Pe people have heard Sasquatch chanting like Gregorian chants in the woods. It's been, re it's been experienced in Washington State and other places. You, you listen to the witness and they say, you know, they, were, they sounded like monks chanting in the woods at night so they have a, we know they have a huge amount of mm -hmm. vocal control but i think they can control the vocalizations to the point of coherency that we don't quite know how to do except a very well-trained singer a well-trained singer that could break a glass with their voice would be an example of mm -hmm. someone that has that type of control mm -hmm. it seems that sasquatch mm -hmm. have something like that they're able to create these sounds mm -hmm. Uh, even the wood knocking sound, you know, uh, uh, J. Rob Alley suggested recently in his interview with Jim Myers on uh, Untold Radio Network, he said he doesn't think they're eating trees. In fact, it's only been seen very seldom of any Sasquatch holding a branch uh, touching a tree. It may not be a big baseball bat hitting a tree. Mm -hmm. They could be doing it with a with their hands, with their, their lung structure, some, some other aspect. Anyway, to go you know, to your question, these sounds are so finely tuned that they can imitate basically whatever they seem to want to imitate. And then they can use the sound in a way, uh, it seems to me, well, let's be honest, if you're hunting prey and you were able to use a sound to incapacitate or paralyze the prey, it would have an advantage mm -hmm. as a predator. Mm -hmm. And they seem certainly to be, you know, I think we could call them one of the top predators. Around. So it seems to be something that they were able to develop. They could use it as a weapon mm -hmm. and they can directionalize it. Mm -hmm. People have described it almost like ventriloquism, right? Mm -hmm. So that's just some sort of highly evolved coherent sound. And there's one further add-on before we go back to your follow-up. Mm -hmm. 
again, just like we were talking about the minerals and the compaction, if you can create coherent sound, like you can create a coherent light, like a laser or coherent microwaves, a maser, mm -hmm. you're again stru affecting the structure of space time by affecting the permittivity of space. Okay. You're affecting it by generating coherent energy and it's gonna affect the permittivity. Uh, I think the Russian researchers called it oscillating permittivity. It's why photographs of ball lightning are inherently blurry. What else do we know that always seems blurry? Right. Right. Every paranormal phenomena we've ever heard about always <laughs> mm -hmm. seems blurry because it's yeah. dealing with oscillating permittivity. In other words, it's not fixed like it is in a material or a metal or water. It's yeah. oscillating back and forth. My theory is that Bigfoot has the ability to create oscillating permittivity, which would create blurriness in photos, mm -hmm batteries going dead, mental confusions, and time loss. So I, the question's excellent. I think it comes from their ability to manipulate sound. And I think okay. after all this research, that's the conclusion that I'm coming to, and it certainly explains a lot of what people experience around them. Sorry if I said a lot no, there, no, but no. that's what I think I mean, is going getting on. To, so let's go to a paranormal hotspot. Yeah. I have one quick question. Yeah. One quick question for Simeon. Is there any correlation to what you just talked about in these photographs that we see of jets breaking the sound barrier and yes. being able to see it? Yes. Jets? You know what I'm talking about? That, you mean that, that weird... That, that, weird that envelope of white. Yeah. That is a function, as far as I know, of the sonic shock wave this affecting water. Okay. Yes. The way it affects... Uh, moisture in the yeah. air, it but, kind of makes it into that. It's a, it's a function of the sonic shock wave. This is what I was going to okay. bounce off, exactly what Brett <clears throat> said, because it is like a, yeah. it's a paranormal <clears throat> shock wave being it's broken. It's a good and this analogy is where, to this it. Is I, where, that's a good analogy. Yes. I understand where you're coming. It's yes. like an analogy to yeah. that sonic boom, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, it's a sonic boom, you, but it can also be a tap. It can be a small sound with a big consequence. I mean, large objects can come through this, and I'm sure if I was a ghost hunter, I would have examples of the rap on the wall, and then there would be a penny from heaven, or a marble, or a shiny object, or a feather, or something like this. So these app ports, these gifts, yeah. we assume from Sasquatch, right? Because we find the handprints, we find the evidence, the hairs, the oily handprints, and in the case of the Al Moon Lab, sightings. Um, we have a recording, Simeon, of what sounded like uh, Louisville Slugger, yeah, popping in the middle of the apple orchard, <laughs> and this is kismet here because his phone's going. So there's audio. I'm watching you now. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> there's audio of what sounds like a Louisville Slugger going off in the yeah. apple orchard, and you hear two feet land as though they're falling from the sky, landing in the field. Mm. There's no lead up to this, right? There's only the Louisville Slugger sound, the sound of something landing, and then marching. It hits the fence, it percussively makes a sound. Yeah. You can't help but draw a conclusion that something jumped out of that sound that happened, right? Yeah. Because this right. is where all the predicated sounds happen. So this isn't a mimic. This isn't what Scott calls the pant, where they're going in on the vocals, on the inhale and the exhale. This isn't a terminal ending. This, this is none of that stuff. No. This has to do with Brett was describing here. This has to do with the breaking of one dimension to the next. Right. You know, I have to say to everyone, the f one of the very first persons I ever heard talking about this years ago when I got interested in this topic, after all my remote viewing students kept telling me about their Sasquatch experience over the years, and I finally got through my very thick skull that this is something I should be paying attention to, I started looking for podcasts, and one of the first persons I heard was Tobe. Oh. Tobe talking about aports at the Al Moon yeah. Labs. So it's quite an honor here to have. Oh, really? You never to told me that. Yes, oh, yes. Oh. You were the first person I remember hearing about I it. Broke his little cherry with hey. the Aport talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Aports, you know, look, matter is frozen light. Yeah. It's E equals MC squared. We've yeah. known about this in quantum mechanics for over 100 years that matter and energy are interchangeable. Right. It's any, you know, Einstein knew about this, Max Planck. There's a fundamental frequency to the universe. It's not like there's this division between matter and energy, especially this comes up in the Bigfoot debate, mm -hmm. is that anything that's made of matter also has a frequency associated with it. Mm -hmm. So for objects to be able to appear uh, just spontaneously like that, 
again, you'd have to have some ability to manipulate energy in a coherent way. But this way. is physical matter. These yeah. are biologicals. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Biologicals can create frequency, can generate frequencies, and it doesn't even have to be something you could hear. Uh, as I often mention when I talk about this, is one of the first examples of A-Ports that I heard was Yuri Geller working with the remote viewing program mm -hmm. at SRI. Mm -hmm. A-Ports would show up around Yuri Geller. You can ask Hal Puthoff or Russ Targ about this. They've mm -hmm. talked about it. Mm -hmm. These are solid, cut-and-dried physicists, laser physicists, mm -hmm who were hired by the government to develop RV, they bring URI over, and A-ports start showing up. Not just any old A-ports. Have you ever witnessed them? No, I haven't seen it myself, but things that they or were missing it? showed up. What? The cigarette story. Yeah, isn't there a cigarette story about one floating out of a pocket? Well, what you're... I mean, uh, I know that's not an app. A port or a port, but that's a good. Okay, what you're talking—that's a great story. That's psychokinesis, and yeah. that's again, this is all a spectrum of phenomena here. You know, I think if we accept it as a spectrum and stop fighting it, we'll realize that reality is a lot more fascinating than we thought it was. Because the story you're referring to is when I was teaching remote viewing in Japan, one of my students that was a brain surgeon took me to hear this guy north of Nagasaki, who could do PK. And of course, I, I'm skeptical like other people. I mean, I'm, you know, university trained. I have to see it. I mean, I'm open to these things, as you all know, but I had to, I really saw things I couldn't believe, including ability to float light objects over his pot. And we talked about this in Flash of Beauty, Paranormal Bigfoot, is these relic neutrinos, these cold neutrinos. It seems that people that can do this can generate this sort of coherency from their energy fields, from their biological material to be able to negate the gravitational field around a very small object. And I was, he, exactly what you're saying, he, he floated a couple of yen notes, the, the currency in Japan. And I'm looking at it, okay, part of my mind's thinking, is there a wire, is it a really small wire? You know, is it's floating around. Then he took a cigarette. It's almost like he read my mind, the skepticism, because he just all of a sudden looked at me. And this cigarette that's in the air above his hand went shooting off in my direction like a torpedo and went, turned, made a right angle turn here and went into my shirt pocket on the first try with force. I still have the cigarette. There's no magnets. There's no wires. Uh, there isn't any way you can fake that, okay? It's from about 20 feet away. And the cigarette comes flying across the room. And the, the thing I remember is the way he looked at me right before it did it. He, was, he could almost see my skepticism. He's like, I'm going to show you. And, and it's like his, he directed it with his eyes. Mm -hmm. And this is like Nina Kaliganina Kaligina from Soviet Union, Russia, that psychic that they tested many times, who was able to move objects around and float objects you know, inside glass partitions. It, 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 there's videos on YouTube. You can see her doing this in front of all these serious Soviet scientists who are convinced it's real. So some people seem to have the ability to tape that type of coherency and generate it into a coherent energy field mm -hmm. to actually create levitation. Mm -hmm. They're actually emitting something with their palms that overcomes the inertial field of the mm -hmm. object mm -hmm. and seems to make it weightless or something mm -hmm. like that. So I actually have seen demonstrations of this. I haven't seen a cryptid, not that I can remember actually. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it happened, I don't know, but I have seen demonstrations of PK that uh, were just mind-boggling. So this, I didn't see this fellow, uh, Mr. Anderson, as he called himself. I can't pronounce his, I forgot his Japanese name. He didn't want publicity. And this is very interesting. I said, can I, YouTube video? You no, know, nope, I don't want publicity because he's found that if people are have a negative attitude towards it in the room, he once had a group of IBM scientists or something, they're very skeptical. It didn't work as well. Right, so there's something about our collective energy field that's affecting reality. Isn't that fascinating? Uh, I'm not saying everyone just be open-minded, believe everything you hear, but but literally, if you have this overly mm -hmm. scoffing attitude, like a negative skepticism, mocking, mm -hmm. that can affect people around you, and it can affect PK practitioners, and it might even affect some of these cryptids mm -hmm. if you want to see them. Right. They might not want to show up if you're emitting that type of negative energy field. And this guy confirmed it. So he didn't want publicity. He didn't want me to mention him or to write about him, even though I went back another time and saw the same demonstration. I'm literally turning glass into a liquid and just stretching it out in front of you Coke bottles and things. 
like this. Um, wow. And, and other really amazing mm -hmm. feats, which uh, I know that one of the people in my class knew the former CEO of Sony, Marita. I'll, I'll just sum it up here. And he told me that the people at Sony told him they had filmed this guy with their best camera, their best video camera, 10,000 frames a second. Mm -hmm. oh, there wow. were no wires. They, they don't know how he did it, but there were no tricks. There was nothing fake about it. So this is the real deal. We have to ask ourselves, how do they do it? Mm -hmm. And what does this have to do? Because when Igor Burtza mm -hmm. presented at the Bailey Conference a couple of years ago, uh, the Sasquatch Outpost Conference in Bailey, Colorado, you know, corresponding with him, and he mentioned this in the talk, he, there were cases of psychokinesis when some of these cryptids, he says, were near their van. And I asked him specifically what he meant. He said little coins would start floating. Things would start moving around. They even had the car engine start by itself, even though they had taken out the battery. They were using it for heating or something like that. Wow. It started anyway. To me, that seems a lot like this psychokinesis. Anyway, guys, you know my point of view on this. These are a spectrum of phenomena that overlap. And we're dealing all with the same sort of fundamental process that expresses itself as things do in our universe in just a myriad number of forms, whether it's cryptids being around you and having sort of strange electromagnetic effects or even things float to people that can do PK, to these A-ports, to remote viewing. <laughs> and uh, even these kind of very strange, as uh, James Shubsky, you know, of Binge and Margie's Outdoor Store said in an interview we did at Vernal, he called them one-off cryptids. This isn't the click a tat ape cat. Uh, it's something that people saw once in that area around the click a tat ape cat that were never seen again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He described some of them to me. These were small beans. Some of them had an insect like appearance. There was one 20 foot bean, which was definitely not a Bigfoot, uh, along there by the Dalles or something, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which he said oh, wow. these people described it very specifically, but it wasn't a Bigfoot. It was just some huge tall thing. This would sort of make sense mm -hmm. if we're. You know, they don't necessarily have to be common to be real. They could be one-off mm -hmm. cryptids. Now, we like repeatability in science. No, no question about it. But that doesn't mean reality has to conform to what we like in science. Oh, my God. Can we put that, like, on a T-shirt? This is exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, thanks for the question. Yeah. You got me going here, Tobes. You got Who me would you. wear a T-shirt that says that, like, reality does not need to conform to our comprehension or whatever Simeon said, so perfectly. Yeah. Uh, just something I wanted to comment on is that, like, what is the common denominator? And I think it is energy and how people perceive energy, how they uh, give off energy, how they receive energy. I mean, you, we've all been in those situations where we've walked into a room and you can feel the vibe. You're oh, just like, oh, I don't want to be here. Yeah, or right. like you walk in yeah. and if you come in just like over the top, excited, yeah. it's contagious. Mm -hmm. And I think that applies to when you're in the woods, when you're dealing with people, uh, any type of energy work. Right. Mike Ferry, I'm going straight to you for a response. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's just a vibe. I mean, if you're like, yeah, Tobes framing me up. Yeah, right. <laughs> composition here i mean yeah it, like we you know when we go out to the woods to film it's it's um we're going in there with open hearts open minds we've got cameras going but um you know and we've come across things we've had we've heard noises we've heard knocks we've heard sounds that we can't explain and you know i've ne never necessarily seen anything that i can say mm -hmm. is concrete um but we've heard things. Mike, what's the craziest stuff that The craziest happened? stuff What's that... your craziest story? Because you've been at this for a while, four years now. I have, but I think, like, I'm usually the guy with the camera on the yeah, shoulder. Yeah, you've been to the Al Moon Lab. I've been so to the Al Moon Lab. What, what crazy thing has happened so to you So putting down the camera and just walking around the space yeah. and taking in all the sights and sounds and smells and everything. I mean, me and Jill have been down deep into it. Um just searching through the brush, not, not necessarily doing anything, but just taking it in and not, not, not talking anything, but just listening. And we hear splashing, we hear something splashing through a creek. You know, we hear kind of like a childlike laughter. We hear something running and splashing, moving water, rocks, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. 
and you know we're perplexed we don't know if there's a water system running through the album lab at this point you know getting a no tobe and daryl mm -hmm. we don't know that so we go back up and we talk to tobe and we're like you know we heard a lot of stuff splashing down in the water like what is that and tobe's like there's no there's no system of water running through the Al Moon lab. There's nothing like that. So, you know, maybe that's just another instance of sound mimicry. I don't know. Or a residual sound from like a native up there, like a Kalapuya. That maybe, a yeah, native. maybe it's that yeah. residual trauma or whatever happened on that land just sticking around through a millennia and showing yeah. up when me and Jill are walking through. I don't know. I'll tell you what was messed up What's was that? after we did Tara's interview to explain who Tara is really so Tara Harris uh, she's a psychic medium that we featured in a flash of beauty paranormal Bigfoot and who lived in the air new tobe from when he was hosting these uh, these uh, how, how would you explain your the get-togethers you would host in Cottage Grove or at Ike's Pizza they were well so this was the idea was the town hall right like if you watch finding bigfoot they'd show up at a town hall that kind of was born out of what we would do at a place called ike's pizza where we put two people together with a beer in their hand and some food and everyone talks squatch right we call it bigfoot and beer real clever title you can steal it if you want and then in portland they called it hop squatch and they kind of turned up we had one called ales and tails and now daryl and i have a drink on YouTube periodically and call it the Al Moon Saloon. So the idea is right li liquid lubrication so you can sit there and talk squatch without your lip quivering. And so this is what we do in a live venue. And um, you know, it takes a while to build up an audience and, and get a response like that. But once you do, then you have your core groupies that came into this facility. In this case, it was the Axe and Fiddle in Cottage Grove. And so I do those once a month. I never dreamed, and I maybe this point wasn't hit home in the video or even in the book, but you know, when you talk about this stuff, like Stephen King would talk about when he was writing that activity would amp up, you know, paranormal activity. So to think it, to talk about it, is to kind of breathe it in, right? Breathe it into existence. And so this is what happens when you start talking Bigfoot too. Like here we are talking about it now, we stand a good chance, right, for something happening here. And so by then I'd kind of grown used to that. So was it that? Maybe. Tara Harris was a part of that. You know, she's this psychic horse whisperer type gal. She's got two little witchy poo friends of hers that come in and talk about all, all of, uh, you know, their ability to send entities out of portals and into portals and they do healings and they've got tremendous evidence, by yeah. the way, right? Like video evidence. Like, you know, the Chucky handprints on the cover of the book where I talk about those four-fingered handprints on the door? This gal, Tara Harris, in this documentary, you guys don't know this, you haven't seen the video, but those crazy little handprints, yeah. she had a video of a black hand coming up out of her phone, a four-fingered, bent black hand, two of them, come up and sway like this back and forth. It was those handprints, no doubt about it. So whatever's going on, this was before we even found those handprints. And she wasn't in the house. Um, these match all the stuff that Daryl Sims finds with abductions. They're all over windows, glass, fused to people's hand, or uh, fused to people's bodies. But, so, I, you know, I thought she was the real deal by the end of this. Okay, so basically what happened was when we were filming with Tara, <coughs> when Mike and Brett were, fil were setting up all the equipment, if you've seen any of our behind the scenes like filming and stuff, we cram a lot of stuff into Brett's car and I'm in the back seat like this with lights <laughs> right, falling right, on right, me. Right, right. So they're getting everything set up. I went off with Tara and her friend Brittany because they were doing, they do clearings up in the woods and clear the land and yeah. It's, I guess you could say it's housekeeping, okay. spiritual housekeeping of the land. So we come back, we do the interview. During the interview, we actually uh, caught, while we were speaking about um, communication, and she's talking about how spirit communicates, she's like, well, yeah, it comes in like pops of light. Watch our sequel, and we get into that. Some synchronicities happen. But we also, talking about communication, 
we caught uh, like this howl like type howl growl thing just over the hill and it was one of those things we heard and I just assumed it was like I just made it up in my head and then she reacted she's like did y'all just hear that Brett thought it was uh, his stomach growling and stuff, but um, no, the, not my stomach. You thought it was hers? It was oh, because yeah, the, the mics were directional mic. Yeah. Oh. So, so we're like, oh, that was interesting. And then, so we get done with the interview, we cut the cameras, and just like off from like where we are, like like maybe what ten feet, the car our cars are parked. Like just on the other side, it sounded like there was a baby crying. It sounded like a legit, like, yeah. child, ba like, a kitten crying or a baby crying, like, something that needed, like, oh, my God, what is it? Yeah. And all of us just were like, what was that? And Tara was, like, delighted. She's like, oh, you guys heard it, too. It wasn't mm -hmm. just, you guys heard mm -hmm. it with your ears, mm -hmm. as did I. Mm -hmm. um, but there was nothing there, mm -hmm. nothing at all. You know, and the year before last, on Mother's Day, Brett and I couldn't think of a better way to honor our mothers than to set up camp down by the altar in the Al Moon oh. wilderness with our camping <laughs> chairs. And uh, it was weird and spooky because at one point, you know, we have a rule, like when we're out in the woods, it's like, you know, buddy system because that's how people go missing and then you end up being the subject of a podcast. But... Uh, Brett's like, I'm just going to walk over here. And the trees are thin and they're spaced out, but the way they're staggered, you can disappear really quick. And all of a sudden, I can't see him. And this is, you know, where it was. He went off in the direction where Daryl Adams took that photo of um, the thing fleeing. And that's why I'm like, okay, God bless you. You're on your own. Right. Um, but I'm sitting there, and then over my shoulder, like, so... If the, okay, if I'm using like props here. If this is the altar, I'm facing this way, looking like that. So over my back, you know, there's that, there's like a little bit of a hill. Yes. I start hearing a woman laughing. Mm. And I'm thinking, I didn't hear any other hiker. There's no other car. No one's out on Mother's Day. I'm hearing a woman laugh. I panic. Mm. I'm like, brat, brat. And mm. he like pops out of like over here i'm like yeah. you should be over here um so yeah there was definitely some weird stuff you know and like that one time we took our associate producer cassandra down there cassandra is she's a skeptic mm -hmm. she's like i'm not saying it doesn't exist but i need to see it and experience yeah, and stuff course. we take her down there and there was a certain spot she walked into and she's like she's like you guys something's happening and her hair all just started to stand up. And she was eating like one of those little mandarin oranges. Oh, and she's holding it and she's like, she's like, she's like the orange is vibrating. Like her hand was like, like, oh, I, no. I don't know how to explain it. Yeah, she's eating that dumb orange, you know, she's. Dumb orange. Well, she, it's just, it was a now. thing. Don't bag on oranges. Well, the thing is that we used to feed those down there. Daryl would leave cuties. Cuties? What? Really? Okay. Okay. So maybe there's connections because she was oh, like, she's okay. like, she's like this. The or she's like, no. Jill, this is vibrating, no. and her hair was all standing Repeat up. Repeat that back to the audience. Okay. So Tobe was just talking about how Daryl yeah. and oh. Tobe would leave those little cuties. cutie mandarin, the peelable no. things. The things you put in the sock because you can't afford gifts on Christmas. <laughs> those are cuties. <laughs> I got plenty of them. <laughs> Anyways, Kenny. No. Um, no, so she it was definitely um she was having an experience, but when she moved away out of that, it died off. Mm -hmm. So then we're sitting up, we're like, okay, we're just gonna hang out and experience the wilderness. And we're in our little camping chairs, just kind of staring off into the abyss of the Owl Moon yeah. wilderness. Brett, meanwhile, finds this decent branch and he's like i'm gonna go do tree knocking and I so don't talk like that hey now <laughs> <laughs> okay go ahead so brett wanders off and like so we're talking we're like yeah that was really weird how that one area <laughs> your hair is standing up and you hear brett like ting like hitting trees and then all of like we're talking i don't know how much time lapse but then all of a sudden bam it sounded like lightning struck and cassandra looked at me and she said that wasn't Brett. 
Oh, so you got a response. Oh. I got a major oh, response. Major you know, response. Wasn't recorded? No. No, we're just, because we're things just happen to... when you're not trying yeah. to re- okay. capture yeah, yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we're like, oh, that's odd. Well, here's where it gets really weird. So Brett had gone down the road, mm-hmm. you know, like as where you come into mm-hmm. where you were set up. And so we're hearing all this, like, on keep, two feet, bipedal walking um, down below in the lab area. And so we're exp- what we thought was the like, breath down a trail, dropped down, was screwing around, and came, was coming up towards us. And then here comes Brett down the road. We look up and we see him coming down the road. And the two of us are like, well, what was down there? And it made me think of uh, Mark Parker's story about being out there with Daryl Adams. And here comes the thing walking up that like pathway. So those are my Al Moon Lab experiences. <laughs> well, the point is, is that there's validation um, when you talk about this stuff. And if I didn't have the courage and Daryl didn't have the courage or, you know, I guess I'm just numb to being ridiculed about this. And at a certain point, you know, 20 years almost now, you get numb to it. And, um, you know, nobody would have had these experiences had we not brought this stuff up. You know, the London trackways you know, are disputed, apparently, by some people. But it brought a larger conversation. I would have never met Daryl had I not gone down to the lake bed to look at these controversial tracks, which weren't controversial in 2012, trust me on that. And so it starts a larger conversation. That's why I encourage anybody here watching this. We've got 142 people and then 6,000 probably in a week watching this. If you have a story, it's your time to talk. The wind is at your back. You don't have to face the ridicule like you used to anymore. This stuff is cool to talk about now. And you can talk about it here. You can talk about it with this team. You can talk about it on your YouTube channel. All you got to do is set up an account. Go start a YouTube channel or whatever. And um, start talking about this stuff because that kind of courage, you know, feeds off other people and they have courage as well in the end. So um, thank you guys for putting the video out. Thank you, Simeon. Thank you, Mike, for making a, a beautiful shot in the end with Brett's editing. And, uh, you know, if you want a Woodwatcher, woodwatchers.com or Woodwatchers on Facebook. Also, um, just real quick plug, we have an event coming up. There we go. Oh. We do have an event coming up um, the end of September, right? These guys are going to be here. It's called Oregon Strange Days. Very limited run, sold out, yada, yada, yada. There is an after party. The after party is going to be um, on the Hood Canal. Okay, it's going to be a three and a half, four hour tour for you to come meet the cast and crew of Flash of Beauty on the Hood Canal on Sunday. Uh, More information on that, that would be the 29th of September, 2024, somewhere on the Hood Canal. Go look it up. I'll give you specifics down the road. Also, there'll be two free tickets. That's it. They're going to be hidden in the Olympic Peninsula. There's going to be a scavenger hunt, so get ready. We're going to start dropping clues here. Each episode will be a new clue starting next time we go live. It's your chance to go out into Bigfoot habitat and have an experience and uh, get a free pass. Any closing thoughts, Simeon, before we go? Mike, Brett? Yeah, you know, uh, I just had a thought about Jill's question about why Bigfoot. It's because they're similar to us and we resonate with their frequency. Perhaps there are many other types that we just don't resonate with. Sorry, I did hope that was a great summation there. Yeah. As you just said that about the scavenger hunt, it just occurred to me why oh. there's more. Because that's something to do with us too. Yeah. Anyway, that's what I have to say. Thanks. That and we'll sense. see you at uh, Olympic Strange Days, right? Yeah, the yeah, first yeah. check it out. And that comment would really resonate with Marcia K. Moore. Uh, Mm -hmm. She said something very similar to me in private, and I think that's absolutely true. They're closest to us. These insect and reptoids, they're not... (laughs) Right, right, not so much. But that's it. And so on that note, if you haven't watched Tobe's interview that dropped this morning, please check it out. Share it with like-minded friends. Share it with people who are not like-minded, because maybe they will take something away from it. 
And on that note, the paranormal is normal. We just need to talk about it more and normalize the conversation. And wait, wait, I have got one more really important thing to say. We love you. Thank you for your support, you guys. You guys are awesome. And we've got all kinds of new surprises coming up too. So stay tuned, stick around, and uh, keep your eyes open for things visible and un invisible. Now bye. can we whip it around really fast? Thanks, there guys. Go. All right, see ya, bye guys. Good night. Okay. Well, oh. There we go. No, no, we still have to end it. Okay. Okay. No okay, kids, it's been real. <laughs>